Hello everyone, my name is Michael SK, and welcome back to Umineko When They Cry. This is our third video in with the third episode. We really haven't gotten going with anything quite yet. We got to see a little bit of Ava's past. The game is trying to make me want to sympathize with Ava, but I won't be having any of that. No, if I'm not constantly hating her, things just aren't right. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I mean... That's kind of all we got out of the previous video, other than me failing to remember how to load a save. That was fun. But now that we're here, and now that we kind of see that we have a bit of a spotlight on Ava, we can kind of get things moving here. There are some thoughts kind of lingering in my head, different ways that we can kind of compare, I, I, I guess, past experiences, whether far in the past or, like, just a couple of years ago, at, like, the least... Uh, and in terms of the changes that these characters are going through, magic has been a term that's been sort of utilized. We saw that in the previous video. And obviously just coming across Beatrice, supposedly, and magic occurring there, like what we saw in episode two, and obviously what we heard of in episode one, and probably what we're going to hear about in every episode is Kinzo coming across Beatrice and the magic that came with that leading to the, you know, eventual success of his family. So, just some things that I'm sort of thinking about that I will keep in the back of my mind as we proceed forward. The bright sunlight outside almost made her dizzy. A small plank for getting off the boat was lowered, and Goto was waiting there, smiling and ready to lend them, lend them a hand. Excuse me. Oh, what a lovely place this is. Hey, yo. The fuck was that? What was that? When she left the boat, it seemed to Ava as though she had heard the voice of her young self. No, it hadn't seemed that way. Someone had told her, Welcome back. After becoming a shameless adult, the voice of her young self was distant. Yeah, that's, uh... Sort of what we kind of saw in the previous video was that she was having a conversation with her younger self, her younger self giving off the idea of utilizing magic in order for things to work out the way they need to work out. And that is becoming the head of the family. Hideyoshi heard herself or heard her talking to herself. When Hideyoshi held on tightly to Ava's shoulders, his firmness alone told her that there was no need to say any more. Maybe it was because the typhoon was getting closer. The lively cries of the seagulls, which usually greeted them when they arrived, could not be heard at all. I'm used to the cries of the Higurashi myself. Oh, that was the end of the chapter. God damn it. I was so close. I should have just kept on recording a little bit more. Damn, we are just... We're really getting into the day, aren't we? I don't really... I don't have the slightest idea as to what sort of direction we're going to be given here in this episode, but we seem to be jumping, like, headfirst into this one. There doesn't seem to be too much of a, uh, like, a lead-up. Episode 2 had quite the lengthy lead-up to everything happening, uh, with Shannon's past, a little bit of Kanun, and we got to see a little bit of Rosa as well. And in episode 1, we had to meet all the characters. <laughs> Six years is a long time. あんがい、自己紹介がなかったら思い出せなかったんじゃないかい。そうかな。私はバトラだってすぐに分かったぜ。口を聞いてさらに確信できたぜ。いや、いや、いや、いや、いや、いや、いや、いや、いや、いや、
complicated discussions, so we ended up leaving them behind. Well, just as I had guessed from the start, the conversation focused on me since I'd been away for six years. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the common thing that gets brought up. Growth spurts can be crazy. They can be absolutely nuts. I remember back in middle school, I think like 7th or 8th grade, I was, uh, I was one of the tall ones, sort of, you know? I, I guess like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, five, 5'8", was like, you know, alright, you're, you're, you're pretty tall, you know? And then high school, it's like, oh wait, alright, wh wherever I was in middle school, and then like the one or two inches I grew in height, to 5'8", five, 5'9", five, wherever the fuck I am now, no, that, that kind of gets passed up. Everybody gets their growth spurt then, and, uh, nope, I was no longer the tall one. <laughs> yeah, I kind of just outed my height, by the way, so... Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I feel short in comparison to uh, a lot of my friends at times. Yeah. <laughs> Again, six years is a fucking long time. I've been having to go back to, like, look at what the fuck was I doing on YouTube six years ago, and it's, like, all a blur. Shannon a lot of people just have really good fucking memory. Just straight up. I'm not one of those people. I'm really not one of those people. When I was younger, I think I had really good, like, memory. I could remember a lot of fine details on a lot of stupid shit. Games and other media. Friends, people that I met. It's just, they were embedded into my brain so goddamn well. Did not help me whatsoever when it came to school, though. Like, I, I still sucked there. My memory uh, for, for stuff I didn't care about was, uh, yeah, lacking. Nowadays, it's like, how? How do I remember anything? We all laugh saying that everyone was like that. Honestly, that's why I can only do, like, these episodes with, like, a one-month break at, like, Pretty much the most somewhere around a one month break or I will just forget fucking everything. That's also why I'm like taking down notes for my predictions or else I'll just fucking forget. It doesn't take six years anymore. It takes like three days. Uh oh. Uh oh. Let's stop the conversation. Oh no. Oh no. It's gonna be cringe. Ah. Uh. You know what? It's not too bad. He, he sprinkled some English in there. Nope, never mind. It got way worse. It got way fucking worse. Ah, you. Why do you say that, though? I mean, I'll admit, anime was really fucking influencing for me back in, like, high school or whenever I was watching it. But, like, no, hold on now. I wouldn't fucking recite any of it. Oh, not you, George, please. Yeah, a little bit. God damn, he's just full on fucking crying. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh my god. マリアもきっと中学くらいになったらそういう恥ずかしいことが口にしたくなるからね。そういう時は口に出す前にチラシの裏に書いて3度読み直してから口にすべきかどうか考えるんだぞ。じゃねえと。きっと後悔するからな。
in the very few videos that I have on my channel, and, and you guys can definitely check them out if you really, really want to, where I'm like talking about something or reviewing a visual novel, which has been my most recent stuff. Go to the older videos and just listen to the stupid shit that I thought writing down into the script would be fantastic to say in a video. Yeah. No, no. There's a lot of things in there where it's like, why did I say that? Why did I think that that was funny or entertaining? What kind of hook is this? God damn, this is tearing him up. After all, this was all stuff I'd let slip out without thinking, so I didn't remember the words exactly. But now that those words were being recited to me, they were as embarrassing as hell. I only recently came to understand this weakness, and was working hard to avoid such careless outbursts, but... I guess I was just born with the habit of speaking without thinking, and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> yeah, let's just keep it to this, please. Thank you, Shannon. Can we all get a, uh, a plus one for Shannon in the chat, please? Yeah, slightly. <laughs> Maria is so nice before she gets all crazy about witches and shit. Oh man, George. No. I know that you're just, you know, using it to as an opportunity to talk to Shannon alone, but please. Can we also get a plus one in the chat for George? For a while, George Anaki laughed at me, as though warming up for when Shannon Chan would tell him about more of my embarrassing misspeaks. I mean, what you guys can also do, and I've brought this up before, it's no fucking secret. Go ahead and watch any of the videos that I recorded around 2015, 2016, 2017. Visual novel, game, whatever. You guys will get to hear all the stupid things that I used to say back in the day because that was just my lingo. And my lingo always changes because of like influences and people I'm around and, and whatever else. But like you guys can go back and you will you will hear a completely different Michael SK. Even six years, very similar to Battler's six years here. Six years is enough to really change a person in a certain way. George looked like he was flirting with Shannon, but he seemed somewhat open and frank about it. He was always that way with his cousins, but he usually took on a reserved, gentlemanly attitude when he came in contact with the servants. When I thought about it, I got the feeling he was being a bit overly friendly, which seems strange. Yes, please piece the puzzle pieces together, Battler. You got this shit. Maria started scribbling in the sand with a stick, and George Anaki and Shannon Chan joined in. This left me and Jessica off to the side, so I asked her secretively. Yo, Jessica. George no Aniki te sa. Now we're just straight up asking. Oh, you know. It's a little obvious. I guess Battler, I don't know, like, Battler's a really smart guy, but I think he, he goes for the comedic bit. Oh yeah, especially her. Yes, absolutely. Actually, six years ago, I remember taking notice of her just a little bit. I see. She really fits well with George Aniki. Nothing I can do about that. 
goodbye, my fleeting first love of six years ago. I mean, when you're in elementary, middle school, I mean, you're going through puberty. You don't know what your heart really desires. You don't really know what you're thinking. Which means that the collection of embarrassing lines Shen and Shan had just held back on probably had something to do with that. Uh, I can't take it. I mean, we've all had childhood crushes before, either on, like, celebrities or people we did know, but, like, you just... It, it would remain nothing but a crush, or you thought somebody was attractive. That's all normal, I would say. Before I had realized it, the two of them had separated themselves from the group and were walking down the beach talking about something. They looked calm, and rather than a light relationship between two lovers, it looked like a more serious one, as though they were already engaged. It is. I keep on bringing up like that six years is a whole lot, you know, agreeing with Battler here. And and really, it's because I have been doing a lot of reminiscing myself as I'm getting prepared to like I'm, I'm making a 10 year look back on my channel sort of video, because, yes, it's been more than 10 years since I started this YouTube channel. And yeah, you, you can definitely see a whole lot of changes. So much change happens in how I speak, how I do my videos, how I record what I record, what my interests are, a lot can change for a person. And it's more than just in this circle, but there's so many things outside the circle that can affect other circles. I don't know why I'm describing it like that. So Battler, you know, sure, there's a lot of old Battler in there, but there's also a lot of new Battler in there. Oh, of course not. Oh, hold on, maybe, maybe we're learning something here. Eventually, you do get the feeling, yeah, I kind of just want that one person. Or I guess if you're, you're more poly, I guess, okay, maybe there's like two or three, but I don't know, that's beyond me. Yeah, could not be me. I hope, honestly. <sighs> For real. You want to know what my question is? Why can't people just be fucking honest? You know? Actually, a little off topic. You guys know that oblivious main character trope that you see in anime a lot, especially like romance anime? It's like, yeah, okay, we have to make a manga that lasts so many chapters or whatever. Or, you know, okay, we got a 12 episode season of, a, of an anime that we got to make here. How do we, you know, fluff this shit out? Uh... Men can be very oblivious. I, I think people just in general can be, but I definitely have an oblivious story from more or less, yeah, six or seven years ago where there was somebody who, now looking back, gave me those signs, but guess what? I'm like, uh, yeah, uh, cool. I totally have no idea what the fuck you're throwing down. And, well, nothing happened. But that shit's true. It is true. Maybe I'm just a fucking dumbass, and, and that's just a me thing. Um, or I guess I really take after a lot of the oblivious main characters in anime. I don't know. I do share a, a bit into Battler where it's like, damn, I wish people could just have fun, you know? Raises eyebrow. Raises other eyebrow. Opens mouth. Let's hear it, Jessica. What you got? Uh, 
Yeah, it's it's obvious now, you know, now that we've gone through episode two. <laughs> I kind of missed it in episode one or didn't really think much of it. Hey, people get very loud when they get embarrassed like that. And it didn't work out. Okay, so what we're getting here is consistency, by the way. Whatever happened, if there really was a presence of Beatrice that, you know, actually, uh, I, I guess, manipulated the events between Shannon and George, Shannon and Jessica, I don't know. But it seems like it definitely happened, and it being, there was some sort of quote-unquote confession that Jessica was trying to do with Kanun, but he shot her down because he truly believes that there is a huge gap between the two. That's a really nice way of putting it. That is such a nice way of putting it. Oh, here we go back to this topic. I honestly do get a really feminine vibe from Jessica. Sure, I, I also get like the tomboyish side, kind of, from what we've seen of her. But that's mostly due to her interactions with her cousins. But past that, no, she's very feminine. I I would say. I mean, feminine and masculine, they're they're changing all the time. You know, what really makes somebody feminine? What makes somebody masculine? Hmm? It's really your perspective of it. No, no. Jessica suddenly, uh, suddenly started talking more meekly, and then her face instantly went slightly red. I see. Even though her confession didn't go well, it looks like she still hasn't given up. But still, I get it. After seeing how close George Aniki and Shanun Chan have gotten, I also kind of want to find a girlfriend. Yeah, my ass needs to fucking go outside and talk to some women. I don't know about you guys, but it's been a while, you know? Actually, how long has it been for me? I think my last relationship ended when I was in my second of three years in university. So, the tail end of 2019, maybe? God damn, it's been a while. Sorry, guys, it just also outed how fucking lonely I've been. You guys now have an idea of my height and how fucking sad I am. What a, what a great recording session this has been. Thank you all for tuning in, honestly. Happy to have you guys. Six years of puberty are pretty important, and they went by pretty fast. As the typhoon approached, the clouds grew steadily grayer, but even so, I had this really refreshing feeling. Maybe I'll try thinking more seriously about the opposite sex, more than just the size of their boobs. No comment there. Patler, you are just insane when it comes to this shit, man. <laughs> Guys, Battler might be, like, intelligent in a way. It's that weird intelligence that doesn't really, like, it doesn't connect to, like, being good at school or anything like that, but just everything fucking else. <laughs> Yeah, 
今このジェシカが狙ってる男は半径1キロ以内にいるか Oh, that's so unfair. い,い,いや、それはそのど,どうだろう k a n u n g h o o n was the only boy on this island now who could possibly become her boyfriend. So, judging by her reaction, I was right on. I didn't think of the Ushirimiya family as a noble family, but love with a servant? I wouldn't have dreamed that two pairs of Romeo and Juliet would be right next to me. And Aunt, <laughs> Aunt Ava would probably become an obstacle to George Anaki and Shanun Chan's love. Yeah, 100%, no doubt. However, I wonder. In this rendition, it seems like Ava's having a bit of an inner fight. So, I wonder if she would be so against it? I guess there's only one way to find out. If Aunt Ava ever learned that Shenun Shen was the partner of her only beloved son, she'd probably scream at her for trying to steal away her precious George. The thing is, is that she kind of did say something to Shenun.、Uh, we saw that in episode two. Unsure if that is a constant. Uh, part of the story that's moving forward in, in all renditions of this,、uh, this family conference here. But、uh, no, that was, that was crazy and, and made me realize, goddamn, Ava a bitch. Just straight up. Like, I would understand their position to be a, a little against it or a lot against it, but to say what she did or what she, say what she said to Shannon in episode two, that was insane. And a relationship between Jessica and Kanun Kun would probably be just as full of difficulties. Aunt Natsuhi was also very strict about that kind of thing. After all, Jessica's husband would probably become the head of the Ushirimiya family in the future. If that person had once been a servant working for the family, well, things would get complicated. Ma, no、Bit of an、so so、understatement there, by the way. It would be a political. Power stance disaster. I really like Battler's character, by the way. He's so much fun to follow. Every time he's on the screen, it's like, all right, it's going to be a good time. Damn, his English is pretty good, too. It didn't even sound like English. He, he pronounced all that really good. <laughs> This voice actor is pretty solid with the English. <laughs> No, 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 I grew a lot these past six years, and being able to celebrate my youth and meet with all of my cousins was truly refreshing. It was a bit late now, but I realized that I should have gotten back together with everyone a lot sooner and returned to the Ushirimiya family. たまにはいとこだけで集まって遊ぶのも悪くないかもしれないなそれはいい提案だねいつかそういう機会を設けてもいいかもしれないね同感だね yeah, like meet every few 私たちいとこはいつまでもずっと仲良しがいいよおいおいそこを強調するとまるで普段の親戚同士の仲が悪いように聞こえちまうぜ<笑> George Anaki and Jessica laughed, but it felt just a little strained. Did I say something wrong? Judging by how her parents made quiet expressions and tired faces every once in a while during the boat ride at and at the airport, maybe I should have kept that to myself. So, then, Jessica, no, you told us, eh? What did you eat, my demo? Naka, you stay, you'll say. Maria, my isha, me, Naka, you see. So, then, eh? 僕たちはいつだってみんなみんな仲良しだよ
私たち何恥ずかしいこと言い合ってんだろうななんだか照れちまうぜ。Yeah, this has been quite the,、uh, the deep conversation trip to the beach, hasn't it? いつまでも一緒にいることどころか仲良くいることさえ難しい生き物なのですからそうだねみんなが仲良くいられることを決して当たり前なことだと思ってはいけないねおお知り合いの魔女が言ってた、oh, here we go all right well it was fun while it lasted I was wondering in the back of my head when is Maria just gonna bring up the fucking witch 幸せはみんなが信じなくちゃかなわないんだって確かにね、信じる力には魔法が宿るかもしれない。それを全員が信じたなら、きっと幸せを運んできてくれるだろうね。よし、なら恥ずかしいことのついでだ。私たちはみんなで信じ合うと誓おうぜ。みんないつまでも仲良しで、いつまでも幸せでいようって。I'm sure this will not fall apart whatsoever as we progress the story. Like hell will end up like our parents. I hope not. I mean, my, my deep hope is that the further that these family lines go, they will stray away from how fucked up Kinzo was and everything, and how fucked up this family kind of was, even if it means that they just have to become ordinary people, ordinary families with no rich ties or anything like that. It might be for the best. As if we'd ever search for each other's weaknesses, going after grandfather's fortune. Uh huh. Uh huh. No matter how much we cousins tried to nostalgically have fun, dark clouds continue to approach Rokinjima. I wonder if the typhoon will pass and let us,、uh, let us see the clear skies before we leave the island. Who cares about what our parents are planning? Who cares about the inheritance and the honor of our old family? As youthful as we, as we were, we were renewing our old friendship. And we all believe together that we could find happiness. So, I want this pair of days to end without anything weird happening in peace and happiness and calmly. No, I don't just want them to end. Please let them end. <laughs> What up, Beatrice? It's been a little bit. She doesn't like this shit. She's, she's like, like, friends, happiness. You know, the future? Nah, none of that. Is this one gonna be a little bit more fair? Oh boy, I can't wait to completely fucking fail at trying to piece things to a, to a sense of realism in this one. That'll be fun. Okay, well, that was quick. And so the tale repeated for the third time. However, to an endless witch, what did it matter whether it was the first, second, or third time? It probably didn't matter at all. After all, this was a tale of fantasy, endlessly repeating until the match was settled. Would Battler surrender first, or would the witch? Well, Battler definitely had his moments in the、uh, previous episode near the end. Then the sky grew dark and cloudy, and the rain and wind were summoned together and became a typhoon. Maria could be seen in the Rose Garden, paying no mind to the rain that had started falling. Going around in circles, searching for that single rose that should have been marked. Oh, we're having that problem again. <laughs> Maria definitely remembered it. That rose had been in the flower bed right here, and yet it wasn't anymore. She didn't know what to do with her irritation and not being able to find something that should have been there. And, moaning bitterly, she couldn't help but keep going back and forth in circles around the same spot. She was acting almost as though she'd be able to see it if she looked at a different angle. But even though she did that, there was no way to find something that wasn't there. Yeah. But then what will happen, right? The wind grew increasingly strong and the rain turned into cold, large drops. There was no way even Maria would fail to notice this. 
However, if she couldn't find her rose here, it would surely disappear forever. Maria believed that. That feeling spurred her on to keep searching for a rose that she had no chance of finding. Just then, the cold drops of rain tormenting Maria were suddenly blocked by Beatrice. Maria raised her head. When she did, she saw an umbrella there protecting her from the rain. And the one holding out that umbrella was... The witch she admired, Beatrice. Oh, you know, just hanging out. I guess we now get to see how this uh, scene supposedly played out from episode one. Maria told Beatrice about how there had been a slightly unhealthy pitiful rose, and that she was sure that they had marked it. それが見つからぬと so I'm assuming she became somewhat of an apprentice like what we saw in the very beginning of this episode. So does Maria actually have some, uh, some magic to use? Maria's face, which had been full of sadness until just now, split open into a grin. Maria knew. She knew that there was nothing Beatrice's magic could not do. So she was sure that Beatrice would be able to find the rose easily, even though Maria couldn't. Beatrice closed her eyes lightly, acting as though she was listening for something in all this wind and rain. Then she heard it, opened her eyes, and spoke. <laughs> Uh, so, so it did just get destroyed. Damn, what a simple, you know, answer. But she wouldn't have accepted that from anybody else. But it seems like she'll accept it here? That's so odd. Something that makes the most sense, you know, despite how unfortunate it is, yeah, a kid might not like it, but that same kid would be willing to completely understand it if it came from a witch? Okay, alright. What Beatrice had said was quite reasonable. There was nothing odd about the flower being broken off at the stem in the strong wind. However, Maria couldn't accept this and bitterly gave a low-pitched moan. Oh, she's not accepting it. <laughs> Maria wiped the tears from her eyes, full of regret. Well, where do we go from here, then? Does Maria just have to simply accept that that's just how it be? Beatrice shrugged her shoulders and chuckled at Maria's pitiful expression. Is this going to be similar to what we saw in the beginning, where the rose will just remember what sort of state it was in before all of this? I sort of feel like this is the direction we're heading in. 
Maria closed her eyes. Then she repeated Beatrice's song-like words. Yeah, it's, it's gotta be the same exact thing. It is. It, it really is. Oh ho, here we go. Damn, I'm gonna be so sick and tired of all these fucking butterfly animations by the end of all these episodes. Like, four or five, probably, yeah, just, that's gonna be it for me. Around Maria, who was concentrating her power, her eyes tightly shut, small golden butterflies began to dance. Was this the manifestation of the magical power Maria held? The glitter of the gold butterflies began to strengthen, and their numbers increased. Then Beatrice raised a finger up to the skies, and they began to gather at the tip of that finger. And welcome back, Rose, right? This was the miracle of the golden magic. The gold butterflies began to condense into a single dazzling grain of gold. It was a single glittering gold seed. It rode on the tip of Beatrice's finger, budded into a golden sprout, and opened into a golden leaf. And then slowly fell from that fingertip, sank into the mud of the flower bed and began to grow steadily. Maria, who admired magic and the witch, really wanted to see this fantastical sight. However, as an apprentice, Maria was still not qualified to see it. No, she was probably afraid that if she opened her eyes to look, the power that she had concentrated in her heart would be cut off and the magic would be lost. Therefore, Beatrice, as the only one permitted to witness this golden miracle, was the only witch, the sole master of many miracles. Then the fully grown rose bloomed, creating one golden flower. And when Beatrice poked it with her finger in just the right way, the gold-colored sparkle scattered, just as if a golden soap bubble had popped, and what remained was a single beautiful rose. It shouldn't be beautiful, though. It's basically a whole different rose. It's supposed to be fucked up. Yeah, damage it a little bit. Beatrice, for the sake of her cute apprentice, who was moaning even more now in concentration, decided to use one more bit of magic. What is she doing? I don't think she's going to purposely damage it. When she snapped her fingers, a single gold butterfly appeared, fluttered around, and landed on the flower that had just been revived. Then it suddenly burst open and disappeared, becoming golden lace and marking the rose. Oh, okay, just getting marked, okay. Now, can you argue that this is a completely different rose at this point? Because it's probably a whole lot healthier than before. Maria was ecstatic over the revived rose, clapping her hands and jumping around in joy. Watching that, Beatrice also smiled, looking fairly pleased. Well, mission accomplished, I guess. Maria won't be all upsetty spaghetti when it comes to that goddamn rose. So, supposedly, that's what went down in episode one, I assume. But, really, what could have happened? Could it have just been a case of Maria using her lovely imagination that, like, oh, she found another rose and just decided, nope, that's mine now? But it still doesn't, you know, figure out the whole idea of her getting an umbrella and becoming dry when Rosa found her, if that's, like, the next step of this story, or this part of the story. By now, I can break and repair any soul if I try, not just that of a rose, and kill and revive as I pleased. 
overcome the barrier of the storm has now sealed Rokinjima off from the natural world. Now is the time for the Golden Witch Beatrice to descend as an endless witch. Beatrice pulled from her pocket an envelope with the family crest, the one-winged eagle, and gave it to Maria. Maria frolicked around at being selected to be the witch's messenger. This is definitely following, uh, this is definitely following episode one's direction quite a bit. You know, I went to the casino with $10 one time, thinking that I had 50 So, yeah, hopefully Kinzo's got some fucking money here. But we're, we're getting ready to fucking kick this, uh, kick this show into gear. Murong, Junbi wa jubun de arzo bea toriichi. Koma wa fundan ni yoi shita zo. You know, I uh, I finally watched that video. I, I I guess this is a well-known meme or whatever, where uh, the family is having dinner at the conference or whatever downstairs, and you can you know faintly hear through the thin ass walls, uh, Kinzo shouting Beatrice and whatever else that he shouts whenever he you know gets into those fits. Absolute funniest shit, straight up. And that, I guess, connects to whenever I had started recording this, I brought up, damn, what if this place has thin-ass walls? Yeah, I can't wait to, uh, once I'm finally done with this game in 2028, I will uh, be able to really engage with a lot of the memery when it comes to this series. There's a bit of it, kind of, not really, that I've seen of Higarashi, but here, I feel like it would be really fun the further we get in. Like, I, I feel like there's going to be a whole lot more to appreciate and, uh, and really just love the memes of, so for now I hold off. I don't want my ass getting spoiled, but yeah, very exciting. Kinzo flung the window of his study open wide, took off the valuable golden ring that had been on his finger, and threw it in the direction of the raging wind and rain. This is all following episode one really well. That ring was struck by lightning and after twinkling gold for an instant disappeared. Kinzo watched it go, grinning broadly and fearlessly. <laughs> No, you will. Yeah, I've seen this go down now twice. I I highly doubt you're winning anything. You get really fucked up in episode two. Jesus. Actually, you get fucked up in episode one. There's a completely different way. Episode one was just... That was ruthless. The ring that Kinzo had thrown became a single gold butterfly and fluttered around in the wind and rain. It headed for the Rose Garden, almost as though it was being guided there. It's fucking loud outside. It then found the figure of the Golden Witch and fluttered down. I guess this is how she gets the, the stamp off the ring or whatever. When it came down right in front of Beatrice, it burst open and returned to its original form, flying through the air. The way it was going, you would have expected it to fall into a puddle, but it stopped suddenly in midair almost as if some transparent person had caught it. Apparently, even Beatrice hadn't expected this. However, she realized she realized what, no, who it was, and grinned broadly at it. It's all coming, what the fuck? Never mind, it's not all coming together. Who the hell are you? And I, I, I don't know. I don't know what kind of joke I can fucking throw in here. Yeah, I'm just fucking confused. As she did, the shadow of the person who had caught the ring began to fuzzily appear. It was the figure of a young man wearing a butler's uniform embroidered with the one-winged eagle crest. There was no man like this among the servants of the Ushiramiya family, so Beatrice laughed as though it was someone she remembered fondly. <laughs> Oh, 
はあ、長いご無沙汰を頂戴しておりました。Who the hell is this guy? このロノフェ、お嬢様にお使いしていることを忘れた日など、ただの一日もございませんよ。ロノフェ、Is that how you pronounce his name? それよりも、お嬢様にこそ、私をお忘れになられたのではないかと、ヒヤヒヤしておりました。何しろ、お嬢様は大層を忘れっぽくていらっしゃいますので。<laughs> なるほど。確かにわらわは忘れやすいようだ。Yeah, it's bound to happen with that whole endless part. そなたの皮肉を聞くまで思い出せぬとはな。お嬢様、これを。With an exaggerated yet elegant gesture, he bowed respectfully and held out to Beatrice the head ring or the head's ring that he had just caught. 後ろ宮金蔵より変換されました。後ろ宮家当主の指輪でございます。指輪は再び主のもとに。うん。金蔵によるゲームの開始宣言。確かに受け取ったぞ。さて、今宵はどのようなお遊びになさいましょうか。早速、ルーレットをご用意いたしましょうか。Oh, of course. それとも、まずは紅茶をご用意いたしましょうか。The game starts around midnight or so. どちらにしようか迷うがとりあえずそなたの挨拶が必要であろうな。うん。あやつめ。開いた口が塞がらぬというような顔をしているに違いないぞ。なあ。Oh? バートラ。God damn it. Yeah, okay. はじめまして。Yeah, okay. So we haven't really met this guy yet. Even、uh, outside the scope of whatever story we're in. 自己紹介をいたします。ベアトリーチェお嬢様のおそばにてお使いしておりますロノウェと申します。OK。Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of weird. I'm a little flabbergasted, you know, that we're meeting somebody like this, but I guess it also kind of makes sense.、Uh, Beatrice has her own furniture,、uh, those goats. She has her steaks. Why can't she have traditional servants too, you know? And I heard the little sound effect, though fucking barely. Let's, uh. Find this character here, Renove, one of the 72 great demons, serves a master in exchange for various forms of compensation. Presently has a contract with Beatrice as her butler, head furniture. Has multiple underlings trained in housekeeping, and he himself is extremely capable as a butler. Employing him as,、uh, has become a kind of status in the high society of witches. Furthermore, the cookies he bakes are superb. And witches will often line up to demand them. That's, that's a little odd, but I guess that kind of humanizes him.、Uh, should possess enormous magical power, but as he always shows deference to his master, his power level is an,、uh, is an unknown quantity. All right.、Uh, we're we're going to be meeting a whole array of people, I feel, eventually. Way beyond my fucking imagination, probably. Yeah, don't worry. I'm also a bit flabbergasted, too. It's all good here, Batlu. I, I don't really know they did the fucking bone dance. Oh, what do you mean? こやつはこう見えても七十二柱に名を連ねる喫水の悪魔でなつまりわらわは悪魔を直接連れてきてまさにその存在を証明してみせたわけだ I mean to be fair Beatrice has quite literally displayed magic in front of us and Battler still refuses to believe any of it <laughs> So I, I really doubt anything is going to change here ロノエは地獄に借位を持つ序列27位の大悪魔よ。Yeah, 27 is a high number, and 27 out of 72, god damn. なかなかに使える男でな。高級で召し上げて、わらわの世話をさせておるのだ。ご紹介いただけまして、光栄。地獄の貴族に名を連ねと
今は卑しい人間の分際って悪魔も裸足で逃げ出すような大魔女であられるベアトリーチェ様の家具頭として使える身ですよ<笑> Yeah, I was gonna say that I feel like he was both complimenting her and insulting her Very uh Very interesting choice of words. Kotobazuka i s t a k e a k o k a o r e t o r i m a s t a m o n o t e s o n o y o n i k e a k o e n k o i t a s m a s k o w a r a m o t a i k t s e n u k a r a s o r e d e So basically, we can argue that this guy is the equivalent of Genji. This is Beatrice's form of Genji. Beatrice turned her back to him, cackling. After bowing once to her back, Renove turned back to Battler and stuck out his right hand, showing off an innocent smile. Normally, this would mean that he was asking for a handshake. And we're fighting on two different sides of the chessboard here, buddy. Kore wa yujo no akshu des. Mochi no mo. Akuma no keyak no teke tsu imi suru mono dewa arimasen no de. I mean, I'm down for a, for a handshake of like, alright, good luck, buddy. You know, let's, let's see how this all goes. But I don't think Battler's doing that. Kore wa anta no arju to ogen ka no massai chu de ne. Kore ga teke to akshu o suru no wa. Oh, of course. I mean, it's tradition at that point. I mean, is he down for a fist fight? Oh, okay. Oh, alright. I mean, we want to go old school and everything, sure. I don't really know what kind of read I want to have on this guy. As Renove laughed tauntingly, he whispered to Battler, bringing his face so close that their noses were almost touching. Battler, his face turning red after getting so close to another of the same sex, pushed him away. Hold on now. That. Why. Why, Battler? Hold on now. That, that shouldn't have fucking. Like. Is there, is there something you want to say, Battler? It's okay. <laughs> he is a good looking guy, though. I'll give him that. As long as it doesn't necessarily kill us out over and over like the fucking steaks have been doing. That's really all he's got going on. You'd think that a bio would talk about more of a character than what we see on the outside, but no, that's, that's his whole fucking personality too. これはこれは、お嬢様に嫉妬させてしまい、もしお嬢様のお客人を、こっそりつまみ食いなどいたしませんよ。それでは、これより他の角度もに、再び家具柱に着任いたしましたことを挨拶してまいります。しばしの暇
そなたも言うようになったなしかし会話は相手を認めるということだわらわとの雑談に応じるようになったということはそなたがわらわの存在を徐々に認め始めている証拠 Yeah, there's a lot of contradiction that happens with Battler and Beatrice here, honestly. たとえお天道様が西から登ることがあろうとも絶対の絶対絶対泣いて俺の靴にキスしたらもうちょい前向きに検討してやってもいいぜ Now we're, 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 you know, gathering a little bit from Beatrice here. Even if Battler was bluffing, he still spoke forcefully, a fearless expression on his face. The witch and her butler snickered together, realizing that their guest had regained more than enough of his willpower to attend to a new game, and that preparations were complete. After Renove exchanged a few words with Beatrice, he bowed silently to Battler, scattered into several gold butterflies, and disappeared. As is tradition with all these wacky ass characters. <laughs> yeah, now where do we go with all this? Yeah, a lot has changed recently, huh? Or is the idea here that he was always present? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, wait until you、uh, meet a couple more witches. I don't think they're sane either, but they definitely add to the pot. ハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハ
Or at least that was our perspective of it all. いくつもの大駒を失い、後の展開がわらわに有利に傾くのは当然のことよ。そなたはおそらくこれからも死に物狂いでわらわのチェックメイトだけからは逃れるだろう。だが、その間にもわらわはそなたの大駒を次々に